Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, How to Get Proactive with Clients Validation. Uh, quick intro, my name is Glenn Gray. I am Director of Product Marketing here at iTentional, and I am joined by our resident expert in all things technology, Rich Martin. Hey, Glenn. Hey, everyone. Well, we're excited to jump into today's topic on how to transition your break, check, fix method to proactive compliance validation to ensure network changes never bring a device or service out of compliance. But before we get started, let's just cover a couple of uh, housekeeping points. So everyone on the call will be muted. Uh, if you have any questions along the way, just please drop them in the questions panel, which you can find under the webinar. We'll do our best to answer questions along the way and cover any remaining ones at the end during our Q&A session. If we don't get to all the questions on this webinar, we will answer them via email shortly after the webinar. <clears throat> so let's get started. Uh, we've already introduced ourselves, so we'll pass this one. Um, so today we're going to just do a quick recap. As you know, this is uh, part four in the series of seven, all about modern compliance techniques. Um, so we're just going to do a quick recap and talk about what is compliance and what are the drivers of compliance, just to, to catch everybody up on that and for the folks that weren't able to join uh, parts one through three. Then we'll talk about what iTential has identified as the components that are key to modern network compliance. And we'll get into a little bit of detail about those. Then we'll talk about the current state, right? You know, what this is, this is really describing how um, enterprises are currently dealing with uh, compliance issues. Then we'll talk about the future state. And, um, and then Rich Martin is going to do a demonstration of how we accomplish all of this in iTentials automation platform. And then of course, we'll follow that up with a Q&A session. So let's get rolling here. Drivers of compliance. So, you know, when we talk about compliance, what we're really talking about here is a set of network standards that, an that is unique to an organization that they design for their network whether that part, whether it's on prem or you know in the public cloud, all of their network, um, and these these drivers of compliance, the things that, that usually set an organization standards, are are typically fall into one of uh, of of the three following buckets, probably all three really, um, and that's security, reliability, and performance. So when we're talking about security, you know, basically we're talking about a set of best practices that you might engineer into your standards and into your device and network service configurations. And this would be a set of best standards to just keep hackers out, to make sure that you've got access control lists in the right types of places, um, you know, to keep people out of the parts of the of the network that they shouldn't, that they don't belong in and, and those types of things. So there are these sort of like internal factors that, that drive this. And then these tend to be this sort of best practices and 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 to some degree kind of like get into business strategy and things like that. But then there are also these external factors that drive um, the security part of compliance. And these could be external regulations like HIPAA, PCI, DSS, those types of things that really inform how an organization has to set its security protocols in each of its configurations for all of its network devices and services. When we talk about reliability, really what we're talking about is uptime here. You know, how reliable is the network you know, how do you fail over if something does fail on the network and those types of things. So these are the types of things that, that are also baked into a network configuration, whether that's on a traditional device or a set of traditional devices, or even in public cloud networking services, SD-WAN and things like that. And what we're really talking about here is, you know, the need to continue running the business um, and to avoid downtime and really to, to avoid, for network engineers specifically to avoid all the finger pointing, it tends to be, it tends to be the network engineer's problem when something is, is not working the way that it should or there's an outage. Um, and what we find through research and just general conversations that we have with customers that a lot of outages, you know, I would say the majority of outages, in fact, tend to happen because of misconfigurations or changes to configurations that are not compliant with those standards that we talked about. And then this third pillar is performance, right? And this is the idea of of making sure that your network is performing to the specifications that you've that you've tagged it for, that you've really created for them. And so for businesses where the network is an essential part of their strategy or an essential part of their business delivery system, performance is a, is a, is a huge, hugely important um, uh, pillar here in these drivers of compliance. So we tend to think about reliability and performance as kind of two sides of the same coin. You know, one is all about uptime and the other is making sure 
that the network isn't slow, that it's doing that it's doing exactly what it's been designed to do to achieve your business strategy and goals. So <clears throat> a little more recap here. We yeah, here at iTential have identified three components that we think are key to modern network compliance. And so I'll just talk through these in a little bit of detail. Um, the first is the ability to create and enforce a golden configuration. And not just across your typical network, you know, your CLI, your physical network devices, but also across cloud network elements, um, SD-WAN controllers, and other application APIs. And so when we're talking about a golden configuration, really what we mean is the part of your configuration for every network device or network service that uh, contains those standards that we just covered in the last slide, right? So again, here, security, reliability, and performance. So you're baking these into your configure into your golden configuration, and then you're enforcing that across all of your uh, other the network devices, all of your network uh, components and network services, to ensure that everything is adhering to the standards that you've set. And what's really important here, while the idea of golden configurations is not a, is not a specifically new one, the idea of, of enforcing golden configurations across every part of your network, CLI devices, cloud network elements, controllers, and so on, is something that's unique um, to iTential. Um, the second piece here is the ability to automate the remediation of compliance issues found. Right, so this is the ability to immediately respond to configuration changes that have happened somewhere on your network that are not in compliance with those golden configuration standards that we've set. And this is a really an important one here because oftentimes what happens is, you know, you, a configuration change is made to some component on the network and perhaps it doesn't bring the network down or it doesn't even really change performance all that much in the here and now, but over time there's some sort of degradation there's some sort of ACL rule that's changed. Now you've got some sort of security problem. And unless you've got automated compliance reporting, followed up by, you know, regularly, and then followed up by automated remediation of these compliance issues, you, you could have a situation in which you've got a hole opened up to the entire world and anybody can get in. Um, these types of problems are, are, are typically found when, when you don't have some sort of uh, regular compliance reporting um, uh, in place. And so in, in, in the here and now, and sort of the, the, the way that current, currently that enterprises are dealing with this, is they may have some compliance reporting out there, and they may find issues as they arrive, or as they arise, but then they have to go in and manually um, change these things to try and figure out where they were, um, all the troubleshooting that's involved in that. And the automation of remediation, um, along with compliance reporting in a, in, a, in a single workflow, can really cut down that troubleshooting time really from hours to seconds. Um, so this is a really key component and an important part of modern network compliance. The third one is the ability to validate changes to devices before they are made. And this is what we're gonna be covering in depth today. And this idea is really about getting proactive on your network. It's about putting something in place, putting automations in place that allow people to check the configuration changes that they want to make on a network, anywhere on a network, before pushing them into production to ensure that they don't break something or that they don't violate one of the policies or rules that you set forth in your golden configuration. Um, these last two, these three things really put together, I think are, are you know, are, are obviously key components here, but the last two are really important because um, the one, the, the, the third one, validation changes um, before they go into production prevents these things from happening, but it's not going to catch all of the stuff that happens um, if someone comes in and makes, um, you know, a configuration change, does it go through the change management process or something along those lines, right? So if you've got someone that's kind of going rogue on the network out there, the ability to automate remediation is the other side of that coin. coin. So the two of those things put together can really um, uh, streamline uh, compliance processes and ensure that your network stays in compliance. Okay, so Rich, let's talk about how network teams are managing compliance issues that they find today. Sure. Um, yeah. So historically, what we what we've seen, and this is just kind of the natural way things happen, right? So uh, you have a network. You know, you have a group of network engineers. We're managing things like our campus network, our data center, our remote office sites, and uh, somebody makes a change to one of those network devices, and it and it breaks something, right? And you you talked about some of the things that that could be 
could be broken, right? And when we say break, it really uh, violates some sort of compliance, like you ought not put these configurations in because of security or reliability or performance, uh, you know, things behind that. And so in, in the best case, and I think you mentioned this a little bit, I guess in a sense it's the best case, is so suppose that uh, my buddy Greg makes a change on a router that takes a service down. So maybe a remote site goes down, right? So there's a, there's a configuration change that has broken a service. And how quickly do we, do we understand that, that something is out in that case? Well, it's immediate, right? Somebody on the other end now, because their, their internet service or their, their network service is down due to this change that Greg made, um, you know, they immediately know, they, they phone into IT, IT says, oh, you know, yep, it's down. So that, that's kind of like the, the break to check and now you have this other side of this uh, the, the, this this event is the check to fix. Like, how quickly can you get to? All right, we know something's down. How do we remediate it? How do we fix it? A lot of times, if you have somebody who made the change immediately, well, you go back to that source. We go to Greg and say, "What did you do?" Ultimately, the the the, the thought is always like, "What has changed in our configuration to make this thing?" you know, go down. And, and, and if it's a is it if it's due to a configuration change, those kind of immediately immediate breaks they're pretty easy to, to identify. You don't really want to do that, but you know, it does happen. Um, and then the fix is, okay, well, let's just, you know, roll back that configuration or Greg needs to tell us what he did. Maybe he put a wrong, the wrong IP address in, maybe he put a, he updated the, uh, uh, some sort of security policy, which took something down, changed the routing policy. And so you, you have that. So that's a very natural way of, of managing compliance, right? Um, it's not, the most efficient way, but it's the way that historically that we, we've we've done these things. And that's like the, the case where Greg breaks something that immediately has an impact on the network. What this you, what, seems like a real problem on a network. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, every network team has its Greg. So, <laughs> so, but you mentioned earlier, kind of like a more insidious kind of change that could cause problems. And these to me, you know, are the worst. Uh, let's say there's a, a reliability feature that gets configured on a network device. Um, could be a failover, right? So in the event of one link goes down, we need to fail over to another link. And a lot of times you have to have those, those configurations in sync with the device on the other side so that, you know, they can fail over, uh, you know, in unity, so to speak. So they have to be kind of synchronized and their configurations have to match. And that becomes a great you know, section of your compliance, your golden configuration standard for those devices. In order to ensure reliability between these two devices, we need to make sure these particular features, these CLI configurations exist on both sides and they match up to one another. Um, but for instance, what if some, some change happens that doesn't break the original connection, right? It doesn't take things down like in the first case, but it breaks the, the, the failover, the, the reliability function. So as, so as long as that, that initial, like maybe the primary link is up, you won't ever see that the failover is going to fail because the, the configurations are out of sync. And the only time you see that is when the primary link actually goes down. So maybe, you know, that farmer with the backhoe cuts, cuts the, uh, the fiber link and it, it brings everything down. That's always the case, right? Um, Farmer Martin, as I recall. That's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's when you find out. Oh no, my configuration is out of sync. So essentially, there was a compliance standard that should have been there that's not there, right? Because the processes and things didn't happen. And now, since it's not immediate, who made the change? How how long ago was the change made? So look at the delta between your break and your check. How long did that take? And it now, months, yeah, it could be right. And now, what's the delta between of time between the, your check and your fix? So now everybody's scrambling to figure out what just happened. And if it was Greg who likes to go rogue and make changes, you know, outside of any kind of change management or any kind of automation, then you're, you're really in a, you know, in a bind because it's like, okay, this could have been months ago. Who made the change? We don't know. What is the nature of the change? So really you're going back to like old configurations and trying to figure out, okay, what's changed? When's the last time we had a backup of this configuration? Compare it to what, what it looks like now. Does that have any impact on these features? And so this is exactly why, uh, you know, the, historically we've had these, this, this, you know, this process of break, check, fix. Um, as, as, you know, it's always been kind of a manual thing. That's where it started. I think that, that organizations and enterprises today have, you know, perhaps gotten some tools to help, to help uh, you know, automate some of this. But the reality is um, we really need to automate the whole process and we need to really uh, tie automation with this break check 
fix compliance methodology so that we can reduce the, that time delta between identifying something that has broken the compliance, which ultimately has an impact on features and functionality in the network, sometimes very, very severe, um, and, and remove that delta of, okay, we know what's wrong, and then immediately you know, be able to get to a point where it can be fixed, it can be remediated, uh, ideally outside of a, a manual remediation process, because that, that implies more time, you know, with human intervention, but the flexibility to automate things. And if these, these, these particular changes need some human, human inter intervention, your automation should be able to allow for that as well. And maybe integrate back into your, you know, your, uh, change management process and your change manage your change management IT system. So in a sense here, what we're really talking about is this, is this, this manual process that starts with something breaking, the identification of something breaking, and then the check, which is really the troubleshooting, right? So we've been, and the network engineering team has been alerted to this problem. Now they're, now they're trying to troubleshoot and then they're trying to fix it. And in a best case scenario here, if I'm, if I'm hearing you right, best case scenario here is, is that they've got some sort of automation in place like we talked about in our last, um, last part three of the series. Um, where a compliance report is run on some sort of cadence that's pretty regular. It catches a compliance uh, problem uh, due to some sort of configuration change, and then it automates the remediation of it and perhaps even reporting of it. Uh, so there's sort of a worst case and a best case scenario here, if I'm hearing you right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and ultimately, every enterprise needs to you know, take this process and, 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 and implement it in such a way to reduce the total amount of time it takes to identify and remediate. And, and that has to be done through automation. I mean, if you, especially if you think about the scale at networks today and how quickly the rate of change and how quickly the, the, the growth of networks today, and I'm not talking about just on-prem, but also with cloud. Yeah, exactly. The, the rate of change in, in the public cloud, especially when you've got siloed teams, you've got application delivery teams that are iterating really, really quickly. Um, and oftentimes that means that they have to make some sort of configuration change to a VPC or a VNet or something along those lines. And perhaps that's not handled through the regular change management process. And you end up with one of these issues that we're talking about like today. Correct. So let's move forward and talk about shifting to compliance validation. So, so what do we mean by validation and, and how is this sort of a paradigm shift in the way we think about managing compliance issues? Well, before I get into the technical part of that, can I can I tell a really bad joke? <laughs> Do I have a choice? No, you don't. <laughs> okay. um, all right. So this is an old one, but I think it, I think it kind of it, it reminds me of, of, of this process of, of shifting over to validation. You know, the old joke goes, you know, my buddy Greg goes into the doctor's office and he, his arm is just aching. I mean, it's just aching. And he goes to the doctor's office and he sits down. Doctor looks at him and says, Greg, you know what? Tell me what's wrong with you. And Greg lifts his arm and is he howling in pain. And he goes, Doc, it really hurts every time I do this. And he does it again. See, it hurts. Ah. And he's just excruciating pain. And the doctor looks at him and says, Greg, don't do that. <laughs> it's that simple, huh? It's that simple, right? <laughs> All right. That's a bad joke. I get it. But, but, but it, it frames up this idea. So why validation? Let's avoid that painful break, check, fix uh, process as much as possible. And it's painful. It's painful for everyone, right? So it's avoidance. It's preventative. So if we have a system that allows us to build a compliance standard, like our golden configurations, um, and, and we have this, this reactive process of break, check, fix that we just talked about, then we ought to be able to take that same process and, and use it in a, in a, in a uh, proactive way to say, hey, if I were to make this, these, this particular, these exact changes to this network device or this cloud network service, would this violate the existing golden configuration standards? So instead of looking at it you know, reactively and, and waiting for something to break, this says proactively, Oh no, you can't do that. That will, you know, that that violates the standard. Maybe to back to our example of resilient, you know, it breaks the res resiliency or the, the load balancing or the automatic failover feature, and you know, it, it says you can't do that, right? And so it violates some sort of network uh, standard that has been predefined, and it helps us to prevent the 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 painful scenario of actually having something broken checked and fixed, which is far better. Even it, even optimally, you know, we would want to avoid, you know, those kind of problems, even if our ability to uh, identify break, check and fix is, is completely optimal, right? We can, we can 
detect problems immediately. We can identify what's wrong with them, and then we can remediate them within seconds. <clears throat> it is, it's even still better to avoid that. And that's really what validation is about. It's about uh, preventing that kind of drift in compliance issues before anything is changed, before anything is executed. So uh, imagine automation where uh, a, a user, whether it's a networking person or it could be like through some sort of self-service uh, system, requests a change. And, 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 it, and it might be not be a change. It could be something like, a, you know, a new, which was what we'll demonstrate today, just some sort of net new infrastructure. But along with that infrastructure is like security, uh, you know, considerations on the network and as well as like routing configurations, uh, things like that. So the, 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 the changes requested the changes that, you know, the proposed change is now validated. So again, nothing is actually applied to the network. This just says, if we were to do this, would it violate any of those standards that we have predefined? And then if not, we have to reject those and say, hey, that's, that's not possible and here's why. Um, and then, you know, maybe they go back and, and fix those, those issues of why it, why it was rejected, why they, you know, what particular lines or what particular um, policies did they violate with that proposed change that they asked for and then if it if it if it meets all the criteria then you apply the change execute it and and you know make it live in the network and you know and this is uh you know this is this is again we talked earlier about like how do we reduce the the, the time delta between break check fix well ultimately you avoid it that's the best way right. um which still means you you should still have that process of of you know, re automating your break check fix, but this is the shift that does that does make a big difference in keeping compliance in your network. So now, over time, where like the the traditional method of having these break check fix processes were the primary way of, of detecting a, a problem in the network, a, a change in configuration that uh, violates compliance, and then fixing it. This now, as changes are proposed through self service portals or whatever through automation. You can validate first and avoid making any kind of changes that breaks anything. Um, yeah, yeah, that's great. I, 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 it, it sounds like really what we're talking about here is automation as a means to, to being proactive about avoiding changes that will that will violate some sort of policy on your network or, or cause an outage, and then also automating um, the break check fix model in a sense, right? And that's and right. and the, the ability to remediate um, immediately. To, to bring a network back into compliance. And, and those two things combined really set up kind of a, a set of best standards or best practices around how you should be managing compliance validations, um, compliance reporting, um, and the avoidance really ultimately of compliance problems. Yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. Awesome. All right. Well, I am uh, itching to see this in action, as I'm sure um, other folks are. So let's talk about this demo that you're going to run us through, and uh, and then we'll then we'll take a look at it. Yeah, certainly. Um, so in, in the demo, we we'll take a look at a a you know probably a very useful example for enterprises to see. So we we do a lot of integration with you know, not only networking systems, but also with IT systems, right? We do kind of an API first approach to integration with them. And a lot of times we show uh, how you can, how network engineers and network teams can build automations within our potential automation platform and automation studio, and then publish them internally in, in our system through a self-service portal. In this case, we're going to allow the self-service portal to exist in service now, which is a, you know, wildly popular and very common uh, ITSM system. Uh, where a lot of folks have built, you know, uh, catalogs for self-service. And in this case, we're going to integrate it with ServiceNow on the front end so that somebody can, somebody like an employee can request some new um, AWS infrastructure. In this case, it's going to be uh, compute, EC2 uh, compute and uh, VPC, which includes all kinds of networking and security pieces to a VPC. So they'll be able to initiate that there. It's going to Take, take that uh, request and send it to the automation platform uh, where it runs a, an automation. And in that automation, the very first step is to validate the networking and, and the request that comes in from ServiceNow. So that's the first step. So we want to make sure we don't want to apply anything. We don't want to create anything net new unless it meets the, uh, the, the standards that we have defined for the networking components and, and other components to this, right? And, and the key here is, this allows the networking team to define the compliance standards because they know the networking piece 
the best, right, to apply the compli compliance standards that, that are applicable for this particular service and to enforce them through validation. And then we'll, we'll also see compliance as well. But this gives them the tool and the automation to do all of that. So if it passes the validation, then then the uh, you know if then then everything gets created. If it doesn't, then we fail out and we close the ticket out. Um, and so that's that's what we want to show here. We want to show that how important the validation piece is to avoid any kind of misconfiguration. Well, uh, I, think, I think what's really another important thing here is is just the the business benefit of something like this, right? I mean, this allows you this idea of validation, this uh, automated validation golden configurations and things like that, that this really en enables an organization to do something like self-service infrastructure and do it comfortably and compliantly. And I think that that's a really special thing these days. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's, it's the, it's the validation and the compliance and the integration with all kinds of, you know, other systems and to be able to fluidly and easily, uh, build automation across all of this infrastructure, which which is exactly why Itential is so is so special here, because it does tie all of these things together in our platform. Um, outside of that, you know, it's a real chore to have to build, you know, a com automate your compliance uh, processes if they're not, you know, tied together tightly. And, and this is this is really one of the big advantages that we want to show here is all of this automation and integration. So for the second part of this, um, we talked about like the, the break check fix and how to optimize that. And really, that's what this is really about. This is a closed loop automated remediation. So again, I'll, I'll take on the role of Greg. I will make a change. So we'll spin up a net new uh, AWS infrastructure that's VPC and, uh, and compute. Uh, I will take on the role of Greg and I will make a change to the security group. And this is kind of a common thing that happens. You know, you have a lot of people. Uh, network and non-network that have access to AWS, if somebody inadvertently makes a change to a security group, that could bring something down. That could open up a security you know, problem that, that allows other folks to access it that shouldn't have access to it. And so how quickly can we identify a change right, that has been made that violates the standard? And then how quickly can we remediate it? And in this case, we're going to show this, is, this can be done in an event-driven way and we can do it. We can immediately detect because AWS has something called CloudTrail, and we can we can be notified that an event has occurred to a particular uh, uh, security group. When that change is made, it immediately goes back into the uh, automation platform, kicks off another automation that says, "Okay, what has changed in the security group? Does it does it uh, does it violate our compliance standard? If so, what has been changed, and how do we immediately remediate, remediate it to get it back into compliance? And that's kind of the, the the second part to this. And again, I think you mentioned these are two sides of of the same coin. You need validation, absolutely. You, we need to shift to validation, but there's always going to be the opportunity for somebody to make a change that breaks something outside of the normal process. So being able to integrate in such a way with uh, event driven uh, and and uh, automation through whatever mechanism in this case it's AWS CloudTrail, um, and then immediately remediate that in a in a in an automation shows how we can reduce the the delta of time and get the network that would have that could have potentially been in you know outside of compliance for weeks or months and now reduce it to like seconds. Well, that's great. Well, that, that's great, Rich. Um, let's uh, let's jump in and take a look at it. All right, let me uh, switch the views here. Can I ask the question? Can you see my screen? I can. All right, fantastic. All right, so when we get started, let's take a look. This is the first automation that'll run. And I'm in uh, Automation Studio. That's part of our platform where you can build, you know, networking teams can build automations. And the first thing is, we mentioned earlier that we're going to kick this off from service now as kind of a self-service uh, catalog requests so that any employee could request some new, uh, you know, in this case, a web service. So from service now, we're, we are going to run this first part of the, uh, of, the app, of the automation, and it's going to immediately go into the validation check, this part right here. And so we are going to compare the, the input of the form to uh, a set of standards that we've had defined in the validation check. Uh, and if it fails out because it doesn't meet the standard, which will show that that path, uh, no new networking or no new infrastructure will be created. Uh, because again, if we were to implement that, that would violate uh, compliance and could open up you know, some sort of problem for us in the future, either immediately or in the future. And then the second part of this is when it passes, 
to actually go and, and automate the deployment of all of this, uh, all this AWS infrastructure. So let me switch over to ServiceNow. And this is a fairly typical view of ServiceNow. If we go into automation catalog, I can be an employee and I could say, hey, I really need a, a new cloud application. In this case, it's a web server. So uh, I'm Greg and I'm going to uh, type in things, you know, into this forum that really, especially from a network perspective, aren't good. So I'll give it a general name. Um, since this is a web server, I want to keep it as Apache web server. Custom port. Now, I don't know, but I think I, I want to have uh, port 23 open, which is unencrypted Telnet. This certainly would violate uh, any kind of uh, HIPAA, PCI, or even best practices. You should never have unencrypted management uh, uh, sessions open and available. But hey, I don't know. So I'm going to make these changes here to that port. And from a source address, not being aware of what this does, uh, this, is a, this is the wildcard that allows anybody to access this particular new service. So I've, I've put some things here intentionally because you know, not knowing, not understanding networking, that would violate in a, in a very severe way uh, a compliance standard. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to order this, and then I'm going to move this ticket along in service now so it can be submitted. Uh, so if we go back here to work in progress, and then I save it. Now this will immediately kick off uh, the integration that goes takes us from ServiceNow into um, uh, running an automation in uh, Itential Automation's uh, platform. All right, so it's finished there. And now it's just kicked off this new app, this, this automation that we were just looking at, the workflow, the cloud uh, automation deployment. It's telling us there's a validation failure, so we can take a look at it in a little more detail here. And we can see that there was a validation failure. And if we visualize it, we can now take a look at you know kind of what we looked at earlier in the, uh, in the automation. So it started off, it got all the information from that ServiceNow form, did the validation check, and immediately said, oh, there's a problem here. The, the, the networking details failed to meet our validation um, compliance. And, and so therefore we're not going to allow this to be created. And then here's more detail. This, this could be fleshed out um, you know, it, and sent back to service now, but for the sake of the demo, we're just showing it in kind of in its raw form. But it's essentially saying it didn't match the, the, the validation of the, of the information that was passed to us, didn't match what we needed to what we needed as part of our compliance standard. So in this case, because it failed out, I'll just do a manual cancel. And then that, that'll end the job. Just to be clear here, if, if, you know, for the sake of this demo, we've made it go a little bit quicker, but you could automate something that sends something back to service. Now that sends something Absolutely. back to the originator of the ticket that says, Hey, you've, you've, you've messed up your, your parameters Correct. here. Correct. And, and that, then that would certainly be the way you would build it out. Absolutely. That would go back to service now and say, Hey, we kicked this out. Here's the reason why, you know, explain and then allow them to go back and recreate it um, with, with the correct information that doesn't violate the standards. Absolutely. So if we go back in and now we'll, we'll take the, we'll take the compliant path, right? So, so Greg's been fired and no, no, uh, no. Greg's learned his lesson. He's like, oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't know that was possible. No, it is. So from a custom port, um, we're going to use 8080 because our compliance, our compliance, um, uh, standard here is that it has to be kind of in the 8,000 range for a custom port. This is outside of some of the lower ports that are kind of service already defined by services like Telnet and things like that. So we've defined that as kind of the safe range to open a custom port to this server. And then from a source address, um, we want to uh, make sure our compliance rule says, hey, this should only come from a, you should only be able to access, access this particular server from a secured management uh, network that starts with a 12 address. So in this case, I'm going to actually, I'm going to actually like uh, lock it down to a very specific host. But the compliance standard is it has to be on a secured network, and the secured network is defined by uh, certain IP parameters. So now, if I save this and we move this thing along, as soon as this is kicked off, then it will go back into the uh, Itential Automation platform running that same um, that same automation. And if we take a look at it now, 
and do a visualize. We can see it, it, it passed the security validation check. So we, the last time it went to here and failed out because we were outside of our compliance check. So since we passed the validation, now it's going down the success path of, of yes, we're gonna build this infrastructure. Now I put a manual task in here, which allows this process to stop uh, just for the sake of the demo, but it could, it normally would just go straight into building all of the things that we need for this. Um, so if I go to manual tasks here, I will automatically approve this. And again, we talked about it earlier. There could be, you need flexibility in the, in the, in, in the, um, your ability for your network team to kind of approve, maybe automatically remediate or automatically approve certain things, but other things, maybe they, they need some sort of, uh, you know, human intervention, maybe if it's just oversight. Um, so being able to do that is critically important. So I'm going to approve this. And then we'll go back to the visualize and see where we're moving along in the tasks now. Okay, so the first thing that it's doing now is it's creating the VPC with networking. So with a VPC, you're gonna have you new know, networking components, routing components, you're gonna have security groups. And the security group's important because that's basically you know like your firewall. Um, and, and some of the information we input into that service now field will become part of the security group definition that we'll see in the next part of the demo. Um, so it's it's going into AWS right now. We're doing this integration through uh, APIs. Um, and that, now that it's completed that, it's moved on to this next step, which is creating the EC2 instance. And um, you know this particular this particular one will take a little while, and, and that's just the way AWS is. When you spin up a new instance, it, it takes a little while for it to go. So I mean, we've got probably like another five minutes or so. Okay. Um, well, maybe that's a good time to to check on our our question board and see if we've okay. got any questions in yeah. here that relate cool. to what we're, we're looking at right now. So we've got uh, we've got a few questions in here. I'll kick one off. First one is: Can the validation process be reused in multiple automations, or is it always specific to a particular automation? That's a good question. Uh, so so I would say the best practice is to always reuse as much as possible in your automations, and we make it really easy to do that. Uh, in the platform, we some of these uh, uh, some of these purple boxes are called sub workflows or child processes. Um, so, so the, yes, the, you can reuse them, and that is a best practice because then you only have to uh, you know have a particular validation task that can apply to multiple automations. And and so, in the case of a VPC, for instance, you might want to keep that that compliance uh, that, that that baseline compliance that is is a uh, applied to all of your VPCs in a particular group or for a particular use case. Uh, so you would reuse that validation step. Um, you know, there are multiple ways to do it. And so you can actually have some, you know, some some methods of validation that are integrating with our golden configuration from configuration manager. You can have some validations that uh, use that plus other things. Uh, you know, that, that are specific to the application or the, the automation. There's a lot of ways to do it. There's a lot of flexibility in the platform to do that. Uh, however, best practice is to, to reuse as much as possible. And that's just not for validation, but that's for other mm -hmm. things like uh, uh, being able to reuse the, the fact that, uh, you know, you, you'll have automations or sub, subset of your automations that um, uh, allow you to open an ITSM ticket. That's a fairly common one. Or to update... Um, you know, a notification system like Slack or Teams, those can be modular as well and reusable. So, to, yeah, to answer your question, yes, you can. Uh, it's best practice. And then ultimately, generally speaking, in as you're building automations, it's also best practice to mo to be to make things reusable and modular everywhere you go. Just really quickly, we got, we got another question in that relates to ITSM platforms. And, and the question is, you know, we do not use ServiceNow as an ITSM platform. Could we integrate IAP, which is, you know, itential automation platform and an alternative ITSM platform? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, ServiceNow is the one that always comes up because it's, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's very popular, but we, we have multiple systems that we have already built pre-built integrations with. Um, the, the nice thing about our platform is that if an adapter, so, so an adapter is an integration with a particular system and it's done through APIs. So we can consume the API. So most, especially modern systems, or even you know, we work with customers that have like kind of homegrown systems. Uh, typically there is an API behind it. It's published, either it's published publicly or they, you know, if it's homegrown, they have their own internal 
uh, definition of the APIs, but we can consume that API into the system. Actually, our customers can. They don't even need us to do it. Uh, we can consume that API and create an adapter that allows them to use. And those those API calls that are after we consume them become drag and drop tasks into the uh, into this particular you know automation workflow, so that you can use whatever ITSM system you want. Uh, and again, you can make even make it modular. And so while you know we have customers using all kinds of different ITSM systems, um, and and doing the exact same thing that we're doing here. Excellent. And then just one last question, sure. because it relates to kind of what we're seeing right here. Um, and the question is, can, can we use Itential's Automation Studio to systematically automate the cloud security policy management of their clients' cloud-native web applications on AWS? Okay, let's see. <laughs> can we use Itential's Automation Studio to systematically automate the cloud security? Yes, absolutely we can. So, um, what 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 I'll show what I'll show you here in the next piece is kind of um, is kind of related to that is uh, the security group policy um, that we've created as part of of this net new uh, AWS infrastructure. Um, we could we could have easily done a validation on it. We could we're, we're going to do a um, in this particular case uh, on the next part we're going to do a compliance check on it. But either way, the uh, you can build an automation because we have access to identifying and describing all of the different components of security groups, VPCs, transit gateways, everything that that uh, that AWS exposes in its API is available in the automation studio. So you can create an automation to do any and all of that. Um, so the answer is yes, absolutely. So there, there are actually multiple parts to that question. And I just want to address the the person who put the question in the in the box here. Uh, we will we will answer those offline for you um, uh, just to just just for the sake of time here. We're already running up on about 42 minutes, so we okay. will uh, we will answer those questions offline and send you an email to those. All right. Well, let's move forward. So uh, uh, the new infrastructure has been created. Uh, I wanted to also show the fact that we're back in service now and we we it, because of our integration with service now, we we updated the ticket along the way and closed it, uh, which saves a lot of time for the networking team. Right, so so all of that is done as part of the steps. And if we go into uh, this is the AWS dashboard. If I reload here, looking at my VPCs, we'll see that we've created that on a web server. So this is a VPC that's been created um, that exists now. So we've spun that up. There's a there's a, a web server behind it and a bunch of uh, applicable security groups and things like that. So that's the first part of the demo, uh, showing how the validation can deny or ex or, or allow certain uh, criteria based off of our compliance, and then and then actually go and automate the creation of not just network but security and compute as well. Um, the second part of this is kind of that that closed loop remediation. Um, so in this case, what we want to do is let's take a look at a at a, a workflow here. This is our remediation workflow. So this works on a security group, and very specifically, it's going to work on the security group we just created. Meaning that security group ha now has uh, has network uh, rules applied to it that must remain consistent. And and so th what what is going on here is we've integrated with AWS CloudTrail. It's going to send an event anytime somebody in the dashboard or or through whatever, whatever mechanism makes a change to that security group, and it's going to send that event to the automation platform. And then the potential automation platform, what we can do in Automation Manager is tie that event to a particular automation. So we've created an automation here. This is the AWS security group change event. So if I just enable this, now when that, when, when that security group changes, it's gonna kick off this workflow. And the first thing it's gonna do is gonna detect, okay, AWS is telling me the security group changed, what changed? If, it, if whatever changes is out of compliance, we need to understand what got what got got it out of compliance and then let's generate the configuration back to where it ought to be and then apply it back so that's the automatic remediation that we talked about so now if i go into uh back into the aws dashboard let's go down to security groups and this sg1 is the security group that was created as part of the first automation and if we look down here um if we open the security group up you'll see that we've got some rules here We've got, uh, remember, we, we selected 8080 as our custom port. 
and we selected this IP address as the source address, as the, as the secured network. So that all got created as part of the security group. And this has now become the compliance standard for that security group that we've put into the automation. So if I go into here and I delete things, so for instance, if I delete, oh, I don't know, the web services, that's going to absolutely cause an outage, right? So this is what we were talking about before. We have a compliance standard. That compliance standard defines what can access here. If that compliance uh, standard is broken or changed, it causes an outage. And in this case, it would be an immediate outage that we would, that we would have. So if I save these rules, how do we make this more efficient? We make it more efficient by, um, by integrating. Remember, we talked about uh, how we can uh, reduce the time delta between break check and, and check fix. Um, that's what we're doing here. So we're, we, this automation we just looked at just got kicked off because it, it received an event from AWS saying something changed in that security group. So that happened just like that. So let's take a look at where we're at in the automation. And we can see from the steps here, missing required ingress ports. So what just happened was in the first part of this automation, it was told, hey, your security group has changed. This automation looked at the security group details that were passed to it from AWS in that message. It said, yep, we're out of compliance. And now it's generated uh, a set of, of rules to say, this is how we intend to bring it back into compliance. Again, this is a manual task, this blue one just for the purposes of the demo so that we have a good break point here. But if we work this task, we'll see that it has detected the two things that I changed manually um, out of the dashboard. And so now I can approve this and add the rule. And this will complete it. So it's now going to go back into AWS, make the, that change and bring that, that security group back into compliance. So remember, this is where I just left off, where I deleted those two lines became out of compliance there. If I do a reload now, our automation has brought, brought it back into compliance by adding 80 and 443 back into the security group. That's great. And so see how much we've, we've optimized that whole break check fix process. So this is why these two things need to be automated together, automated validation to avoid those, those kind of <laughs> misconfigurations. And then knowing that there's always going to be the opportunity for misconfigurations to happen. How do we optimize this with automation? And in this case, uh, event-driven automation that allows us to do a closed-loop remediation. Yeah, and, and and you know one one thing I just wanted to point out here is obviously we're doing this in AWS right here, but you can do this for Microsoft Azure, you can do this for uh, GCP, you can do this on you know in your data center with with VMware, you can you, any anywhere you've got any sort of networking or infrastructure components, this sort of compliance. Um, and, and these three key components, golden configuration, automated remediation, and the idea of validation can all be introduced. That's right. So this is a, this is a quick slide that we've, that, we've, uh, that we've presented a couple of times already, but I just wanted to highlight really quickly the sections here that, that we view today. So, you know, we start with inventory management, managing configs and managing devices as part of our, as part of just, you know, your, your basic network configuration management solution. But this fourth step here where we created enforced network standards, today we demonstrated that by showing how to validate against a golden config and how to auto remediate against a golden config. Um, and then of course we've demonstrated auditing and compliance reporting today. Um, so this was the idea of you know, that automated, that automated, that event, uh, event driven automated or closed loop automation that, that Rich kicked off a little while ago that, that in, incorporates some piece of compliance reporting where it's going to go out and it's going to check the configuration change that's been made against the golden configuration and then enforce that change um, through, um, through an automation and through remediation. And then lastly, the last step is validation, which we, we showed in the first part um, of Rich's demo where we validated that changes either meet or do not meet the requirements set forth in the golden configuration. And that is pretty much it for us today. We, we, we have several questions in here um, that I'm afraid we probably don't have time to get to. So we will answer these offline via email. Um, but we, we, we encourage you to join us for part five of seven um, in this webinar series where we'll be covering how network compliance accelerates automation in an enterprise. Um, so, so look forward to, to having you join us on November 9th um, for that piece as well. Uh, as I said, we, uh, we don't have time for, for Q and A's right now, but we will answer any questions that we've got via email. Lastly, I would encourage you to go and, uh, and sign up and try IEP for yourself. We've actually built out 
um, an IEP instance that's accessible to, uh, to anybody um, that has mock device data in it. So you can go try this without actually installing it in your network and see how some of these things work, um, play around with some of the automations that we've created um, against some of this mock device data that we put out there. So um, definitely encourage you to hit itential.com forward slash get started and, um, and try out the platform for yourself. Well, Rich, thanks. That was really informative. Uh, really enjoyed watching that demonstration. And uh, we look forward to connecting with all of you again uh, for part five of the series. So thank you.